thank you for being here. I love that enthusiastic response. A couple of quick things as far as announcements. Uh, one, one thing that's not here on the, on the, uh, on the slide, so I want to be sure to say it before it's gone from my head, is that um, the Acts 242 group that usually meets at the Hughes uh, home, they will not be hosting that this evening. So if you are usually attend there, you're welcome to um, attend the other group that is being uh, hosted at the Duracs home. So uh, just to be aware of that. Um, today is the potluck that happens immediately following our service today that we generally have once a month after um, on a communion Sunday, as Ethan pointed out. He's like, is today communion? He's like, yeah. He goes, and there's a potluck too. Uh, and I think he's kind of making the connection. Hey, these two things seem to happen a lot at the same time. So, uh, potluck today, and uh, hope you can join uh, everyone for that. And uh, the annual church meeting, bring breakfast snacks. That's going to be held right in here at the, in the church sanctuary on Saturday, January 17th. So that's uh, the next uh, coming Saturday from 9 to noon. And uh, that 2014, 2014 review, and 2000, I'm assuming that says review, yes. there's a light in, in, in front of this word, so. And preview for 2015. So uh, bring breakfast snacks to that next Saturday, and, um, and uh, we'll be able to uh, take care of some of those logistical things, and uh, praise God for all of that. And I believe that's it as far as announcements go. I don't, I don't know anything else as far as announcements. And I believe that's the last one as far as the announcement slide. And so we're on to our singing. Thank you very much for being here today and joining us. Let's stand as we uh, pray to begin our worship time this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for every individual that's here. And help us to understand, Lord, that um, our being here is not... Uh, just some coincidence or just uh, it's just where we are that we're here with a purpose and uh, Lord that you in your infinite wisdom and in your sovereign sovereignty Lord have appointed this time for us to be here to gather here to worship you to celebrate you uh, to remember with some soberness but with joy as well what was accomplished at the cross through communion, to fellowship together later, um, to eat together. There's so much that we can enjoy today, and we do all of this as, as one united by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we say thank you for that. As we enter this, into this time of singing, I pray that each one would make a joyful noise unto the Lord, that each one would understand that this is just a great opportunity to say thank you for all you've done and thank you for all you will do in our lives. And we just uh, praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. It is a great time to gather together. We thank you for joining us here at St. Albans Union Church. Thank you for already, in advance, joining us in song. Why are you here? Why are you
are higher than any other. We turn our eyes to you, Lord, today. Help us to push out any distraction, any thoughts of the world. Thank you, Lord, for making us whole. And if our God is for us, then
Welcome, welcome, welcome.
that song, I'm thinking, in, in my head, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing thy word, that God's word, and how it directs me each day, and, and yet, uh, that second verse, and yet my heart is still wandering. How, how important it is to read God's word daily, and what a great light that is. But even with that, I don't know, in my head, I don't know, maybe somebody can relate to this, it seems like I don't put fuel in the lantern. <laughs> I've got it there, I'm reading it daily, and maybe I'm just going through the motions sometimes. Anybody ever experience that? You know, it's just me. So, maybe you can help me out. Because what I realize is that it's more than just read, even as we're singing it. And it's more than just going through the motions of reading the words as we have a daily reading or habit. That it's really allowing it to be that light into our path, you know, that it's giving us that direction and that guidance. I think sometimes I get too caught up in, yep, check, did it today. So that's a real danger. We want to allow God to work through us and to really light our paths. This scripture passage is from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. We're going to say this together. There's three slides that are actually contained in this. Therefore, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And I shared this this morning. That, that previous uh, slide, uh, not acting based on my former ignorance. And too often I find myself slipping into that. Acting on my former ignorance, instead of acting out of a sense of holiness. Not because I'm holy, but why? Because God is holy. That's why. Praise Him. Worthy is Him and only Him. Worthy is the
benefit other families that are in need or in crisis. Today's our family uh, fund, family care fund. There we go, family care fund. Uh, so if you want to give specifically to the family care fund, just put that on your check or on your envelope. Because there are families that we don't know who they would be until God brings them to our attention. And then as elders, we take the family care fund and we distribute it to needy families within our church. That's all part of glory to God, isn't it? Because there's not a one of us here that receives any income whatsoever were it not for God enabling us, whether it be to teach or to construct or to whatever it might be. He enables us to do these things, right? And you and I who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior understand that. We are who we are. We're doing what we're doing, not just simply for a paycheck. We're doing it for the glory of God. And so, as the ushers come forward to receive this offering, when you put that check or that cash in the plate, just say, to God be the glory. Maybe quietly or maybe out loud. But celebrate it. It's an act of worship. All right? And then after that, we're going to continue our worship, and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. All right? So let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings, for your love for us. And Lord, sometimes we just go through this whole thing and, and I myself will often look at the offering time as this is part of my checklist, as Dean pointed out. But really, Father, it's part of my worship. It is my privilege, it is our privilege to be able to have a part in your kingdom work on this earth. And so, Father, we take these finances, we give them to you, O oh God, and we ask that you would take and bless them in supernatural ways, stretch them in ways that impact lives all around the world and especially within our community here. And then, Father, as we celebrate the Lord's table, help us to understand that the only reason we can have an impact on our culture, on our society, on our neighbors, on our family, is because Jesus came in the flesh. He lived on this planet so that he could give his life for us. So that he would pay the penalty for our sin. He would shed his blood in our place so that we could live forever with him. So that we could share with others about his incredible love and his desire that they too become part of God's family. So Father, during this next several minutes of worship together, we pray that your spirit would move upon us, would speak to us individually as only you can. Father, whatever's on our hearts, we want to just give them to you, trusting you with the results. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection.
Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We celebrate the fact that Jesus not only died on the cross for our salvation, but his sacrifice was all that was needed. Because the Father accepted it, and he raised from the dead. Jesus is not dead. He is not someone who that we revere his statue, his sepulcher, any tombstones. Jesus is alive today. And he will come, and he will take us to be home with him forever. As the cup is shared, please take the cup, drink it, replace the cup in there, and we will go on to the next person. Serve the person next to you, and do so with the spirit of genuine love. <coughs>
you. And Lord, I pray for each one of these boys and girls who are here today. Lord, we just pray that us grown-ups and older people will be um, just an example to them and show them their, that they're special and that you love them so much. We pray for them now as they go down to hear from your word. And we pray that you'd be with Mr. D and Mrs. D as they um, show your love to them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, I'm happy to tell you I really enjoy seeing a fuller congregation. And so I'm thankful the snow's not flying and it's relatively warm, depends on who your relatives are. Polar bears, it's quite warm. Walruses in the south, probably not. We're that way the seals in the south. Today we're going to be looking at choices and consequences. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 13, verses 18 through 30. Now, some of you uh, are American Revolution folks. I'm looking for uh, Chuck and Patty, but they probably are in the nursery for their own thing. Because if you want to talk to somebody about uh, American Revolution, talk to one of the Gallisons. They pretty well got it down. They, they know that stuff. There's others of you that really enjoy that as well. But uh, I got a name for you. Simon Gertie. Does anybody know who Simon Gertie is? Okay. Well, I'm glad. He is infamous. In other words, he's famous for something negative. So he's infamous, in case you're just kind of wondering what the difference was. He actually deserted the Continental Army. He gathered about him a whole bunch of Native Americans, and he trained them, and they actually went out in raiding parties against the colonists and were extremely brutal and cruel to the colonists that were there. Now, we today, as well as most historians, would go back and say, well, he was definitely a traitor. You know, maybe it helps if I turn that on. How's that? Is that better up there, guys? Thank you. There's an even more famous character uh, from the American Revolution. Most of you know him. He was an individual who uh, was up and rising in the military. Uh, he wanted to be promoted. He, part of the reason for that was not so much that he cared about his military career, but he had a very luxurious lifestyle that he was supporting. He, he thought that he should be on the lifestyles of the rich and famous in a couple centuries. And so he was going to advance, but he was always being overlooked for promotion. So he thought, that's how you're going to treat me. I'm going to get the key to West Point, and I'm going to give it to the British and let them do something to you guys and see what you think about that. Well, the British major that had this information was en route to General Clinton of the British, and on the way there, he was captured. Well, obviously, he's captured on the way to say, I've got some neat things that I want to tell you about. That exposed the traitor who was going to sell out the 13 colonies, and he then deserted to the British this traitor did, and he fought against his own country. Do you guys know his name? Ah, yeah. uh, Benedict Arnold. No pulling the wool over your eyes. He, interestingly, died in England, hated by the Americans and the British. Because if he turned traitor once, not a very nice guy. Well, today we're going to be looking at one of the most well-known traitors of all time. And his name, obviously, was Judas. Now, we don't know terribly much about Judas, but there are some things that we do know about him that make him somewhat fascinating. We know that of the 12 closest disciples, he was the only one who was not a Galilean. So you might be thinking, okay, he's the odd one out. And he probably was, to a degree. We also know that as we look at the list given in the Gospels about the different apostles, his name always falls last. And in the book of Acts, his name is not even mentioned in the list of the uh, apostles. He's talked about, but not as one of the group. Interestingly, all of the Gospels refer to him in some manner like this, the traitor who betrayed Jesus. Okay? Now, 
In sports, I love sports a lot, but sometimes I was the best player for the other team. <laughs> you really don't like to be known as the best player for the other side, do you? Well, Judas was that way, except he did this with evil intent. Mine was just clumsiness. However, he was not all bad. It wasn't obvious. He wasn't walking around with a smirk on his face and horns on his head. In fact, they made him treasurer. The others made him treasurer. So they evidently trusted him. They thought that there was something unique about him that qualified him to be the treasurer. Also, remember when Jesus was teaching and preaching and, and there's a time period when the big crowd comes around and then all of a sudden it says the disciples left him because his teachings were too difficult to follow? And then Jesus says, are you, are you guys going to go to And he said, no, of course not. Where would we go? Interestingly, Judas stayed there with them. He didn't bail and run either. In the midst of Jesus' closest disciples, Judas was hanging around. And yet, none of them had suspicions about him. He knew how to blend in. He's a chameleon, as it were. But I find it fascinating that in all this, he did not choose to surrender his life to Jesus Christ. Why is that? Well, it seems to get what he wanted, he was willing to become the most infamous traitor of all time. He may have thought he was making the right choice because he wasn't listening to God's wisdom. He may have thought he knew what was best. You know, I've been around all this time. I've seen what the Romans have done. Jesus is an idealist. He just doesn't understand. i got to have Jesus back. i got to do this the correct way. Judas may have thought those things. However, he was actually rebelling against God. His choice took him out of the light and into darkness for eternity. So what I want us to hold on to today as we go through this passage is just simply this simple truth. You and I must present Jesus in such a way that others would choose Jesus. Okay? Now I'm not implying that the other disciples nor Jesus lived in that way because some people are just going to rebel as Judas did rebel. However, you and I need to be certain that we are living our life in such a way that when faced with the choice, and we should always live in such a way that others are faced with the choice, that they would choose to follow Jesus. Okay? So we're going to look first of all at clarification. Maybe. Clarification is found in verses 18 through 21. And we'll be reading this out of the NAS, No American Standard. He says, I do not speak to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. And that's not working today. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass. So that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. It's kind of a sad closure to that paragraph. As you look at verse 18, go back in your Bibles, look at verse 18. We're reminded here of the sovereignty and the omniscience of Jesus. Jesus is not going to be surprised at anything that is about to happen. None of this is going to catch him off guard. Jesus isn't going to look up and say, Judas, didn't see you coming. Who would have figured? That, that's, Jesus isn't going to be surprised by this at all. Here we read, he's basically informing the disciples... Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you before it happens so you know when it happens. I knew about it because I'm God. I am He. Last night, I was close to prophesying something. 
Did you know I actually prophesied the last touchdown? <laughs> I did. What was the word? It had something to do with going home. Oh, Alabama. Alabama. When he when he shouted out Alabama, he doesn't know he shouted out Alabama. And I say he's going to throw a touchdown. Sweet home, Alabama. Go home. Yeah. You know I'm not a real prophet. Let me tell you. But I felt good when it happened. In fact, everyone in the house said, "See, I said that. I, I said that. I told you." Well, Jesus is saying, you know what? Something's going to happen. I'm not going to be surprised. I'm telling you what's going to happen now before it happens, so that when it happens, you know I knew it was going to happen. You follow that? Take that down in notes. <laughs> so you, you see this going on, and, and we look at this and we say, okay, if he knew this, why did he choose Judas? Why would he have chosen Judas if he weren't going to be a believer in Jesus? Well, he answers it here, doesn't he? To fulfill scripture. To fulfill scripture. This choice was made to fulfill scripture. We see it prophesied in 2 Samuel. We see it prophesied in the Psalms. We see it prophesied in Zechariah. All that Judas was about to do, Jesus knew about before time began. Now that will get your brain to start aching here pretty soon. Because I don't understand how that fits into place. But we can't let Judas off the hook. Because Judas was without excuse. Because he had ample opportunity to repent and to follow after Jesus Christ. But he chose to rebel against God. Verse 19 gives some further insight. As the disciples may have wondered, I don't know that they did, but you know, that would be my thing. Okay, if, if something's going to happen and later on you see Judas pull this fast one, you say, did Jesus... I thought he was God, but God would have known this, wouldn't he? God wouldn't have got trapped in the situation that's about to happen. But the reality is, Jesus is telling him, I am truly God. I want you to understand that. But it's also an encouragement to you and to me. Because do you and I not sometimes wonder, where's God? Something terrible, horrific happens? And we say, why didn't God see that one coming? I mean, if he's in charge, what's going on here? And I believe the Holy Spirit caused John to write this down and Jesus to share this to be an encouragement not only to them at that time, but to us. Because when things get difficult along the way, you and I, as well as these disciples, needed to remember God's in charge. He knows what's happening. Everything is designed with the glory of God in mind. Warren Wiersbe has a wonderful quote. He says, The Christian who knows the word will not easily be discouraged by the defeats that occur along the way. In other words, if you and I know what the Bible says, as some of you have quoted, I've read the last page, you know what God's design is then along the way, you won't get discouraged as easily. It may be painful at the time, but you know God's still in charge. Then in verse 20, Jesus assures them that what Judas is about to do, he doesn't use the word Judas, I'm saying that because we've got 2020 spiritual hindsight, that does not cause God's purposes for the disciples to cease. Just because he's about to do this heinous Traitors act doesn't mean that they are no longer needing to proclaim the gospel. They're still to go out with the message, and guess what, folks? It's going to be effective no matter what Jesus does. It's going to be effective no matter what. The commission to go out and proclaim Jesus is just as valid today as it was in the time that Jesus walked this earth. And if Jesus sends his people into the world, those people out there who receive that message from us will be blessed. We need to remember that, folks. Because you and I live in a day and age when it seems like everyone's trying to silence the church. We live in a time when it seems like if you speak for the cause of Jesus, people try to shut you down. But folks, it doesn't matter what the world out there is trying to do to us or to the church. The reality is our message about the cross of Jesus Christ 
is just as powerful and effective today as it was then. And regardless of what happens, the message will still go forth with power. You cannot shut down God. You cannot silence the work of the Holy Spirit. He will accomplish His purpose. Even though it may seem as though the death knell is being sounded for the church, nothing can stand up against the power of Jesus Christ. Because you and I are ambassadors, and we represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We have the only hope in Jesus Christ. That's the only hope that's available to be offered. Then we run into that troubling comment. And that's a pun, by the way, the troubling comment. We've seen this phrase before, haven't we? Where Jesus is troubled in spirit. As Jesus is sharing here, it's almost as if Jesus suddenly becomes reflective. Now, you remember what the word troubled mean here. It's the same word that was used another message some time back. It refers to severe, intense, mental, emotional, and spiritual conflict and turmoil within a person. Why? Jesus just got through explaining that he's God. He's, he's going to be telling us all this before it happens. Why? Why is this so troublesome? Well, think about it. Let's try and think about this in human terms because Jesus is fully God, fully man, correct? I believe that just because Judas was going to betray Jesus, that could not stop Jesus from loving him. Does that not strike home with you? Jesus knew that Satan was about to totally take over and control Judas. I'm convinced that brought incredible turmoil to Jesus. Then to think that Judas was making the choice of a lifetime to be forever tormented and tortured in hell rather than simply follow after him. That had to grieve Jesus greatly. Folks, please understand, Jesus does not delight in anyone going to hell. He gets no pleasure in that. But it has to happen for those who reject him. He also may have been troubled by what was about to happen in his own life as a result of Judas' betrayal. First of all, he was about to experience the most horrific means of death that mankind has ever experienced. He was also about to take ownership and responsibility for the sins of the world even though he had no sin. Now psychologically today, if someone is blamed for the problems and sins of someone else, or if they're forced to take responsibility for someone else's wrong actions, there's incredible psychological turmoil. Jesus is about to do it here for the entire world. For all time. That's got to be tough. Then there's the matter of being separated from his father, which had never taken place before. In these verses, we see two choices presented. The first is dealing with Judas. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen, yet Judas is still faced with a choice. He could go through with his devious plot, or he could repent of it and choose to follow Jesus. Sadly, his choice is going to be choosing darkness and not choosing light. And because of that choice, the consequences will be eternal damnation and hell. But the disciples also are presented with a choice here, though they won't fully recognize it at the time. Regardless of what negative attacks or opposition comes their way. They have a choice. They can continue to proclaim Christ or they can be silent. It's safer for silent, right? Or they can just say, we can't be quiet. We've got to tell the world about Jesus. Jesus is encouraging them to keep on talking. Keep on their ministry. See, these are the choices given to all humanity, isn't it? Choose darkness experience eternal condemnation and separation from God. Choose the light of Christ and experience eternal life. But you get another choice after that. If you choose eternal life with Christ, you can choose to keep it to yourself. Or you can share it with the world. 
regardless of what opposition comes your way. Well, in the words of Back to the Future, that's heavy. A lot of heavy information. And it had to be somewhat confusing to the disciples. So, we're going to call the next part confusion. Verses 22 through 25. We see here, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know which of them, what, in which one he was speaking, which one of them he's speaking about. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. He, meaning John, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? The best description I can imagine is one of absolute confusion. These guys had seen Jesus deal with everything head on and without fear. If there's a group wanting to kill him, he dealt with it. He just walked through the crowd. He just disappeared. Or he'd speak in such a way that they're going, oh, not knowing what to do next. Big storm coming, he speaks. Water still. Even I could have been out there on that boat. Somebody dies, if God gets the glory for raising them from the dead, he'll raise them. Somebody's sick, he'll heal them. There was nothing too big for Jesus. He could do it all. He's God. But who is he talking about here? Who or what could possibly overpower Jesus? What is this conversation they're having? Now, you and I look back and we go, guys, it's Judas. Think. Don't you know all of it? It's Judas. Come on. What? You say, why didn't they get it? What, what were they missing? But Judas was clever. Like Satan, he knew how to deceive. In addition, you will never find any place in the scriptures prior to this time where Jesus treated Judas any differently than he did the other eleven. Isn't that interesting? He treated Judas with honor, with love, with respect. Jesus blessed him and protected him just like he did the others. He was so good that we see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, Judas says, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And the other disciples didn't go, You're lying! They didn't know. They genuinely didn't know. But you got to love Peter. Can't keep his mouth shut. But interestingly, he's not out in our faces this time. Remember how they were sitting around the table? Not like Da Vinci paints them, but like a typical Jewish, kind of a, a U-type situation. They're leaning on the floor. Who was it, Nick? You practice that all week? Kind lean, of leaning on the floor. Jesus is sitting over here. John's over here. We don't know where Peter was, but Peter and John were good buddies. John, leaning back, Jesus is behind him. He said, I. Probably the, they were men. They're not quiet. They weren't polite. They were noisy. This is just between Jesus and John. And then Jesus explains a little bit more. We're going to look at that now in the confirmation. Verses 26 through 30. Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But again, not a big deal. Now one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. You want to guess who that is? John. 
He guessed it because Jesus had just told him, right? For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor, which was very common. It was almost like Christmas. You give something to the poor in appreciation for what God has done for you and rescue you out of bondage. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Think about it. If Jesus would have said that loudly enough for all the men to hear, what do you think those guys would have done? Probably pounced on him and beaten him within an inch of his life. Who do you think you are? What, what is going in your mind? Why would you? But John spoke directly to Jesus in verse 25. So we assume that verse 26, Jesus is directing it back to John. But even here, John probably didn't grasp the full impact of this. Now, as you look at this, you, you look and you say, what's, is there significance to this morsel? At least I did. You're thinking, what? what's so significant about this? And I'm so thankful for our Christian Jewish friends that give some great insight into this. The morsel is usually a piece of unleavened bread. Sometimes it can be a piece of meat. And it's dipped into this, for lack of a better word, sauce, uh, so that it's, it's mixed up with bitter herbs, vinegar, water, salt, crushed dates, figs, and raisins. You know, the vinegar and water and salt, I could enjoy that, but the rest of it gets a little bit beyond me, but that's part of the tradition there. <clears throat> they state that if you are given the first morsel, that is a sign of incredible honor. Do you catch the significance? Judas is about to betray God. And Jesus is giving him another opportunity. He's treating him with dignity, honor, respect. Think of Lauren O'Hara's song, Unbelievable Love. That's, that's a song he was giving. Going through my mind, and I think of myself, I'm no better than Judas. I've done some things that are so hurtful and hateful towards God, and yet he extends to me that morsel and says, join me. Join me. But Judas's heart had already been hardened, and there would be no repentance. Here is where there's no longer an option for salvation for him. How do we know that? Because John says, Satan entered into him. Several commentators suggest that it was at that precise moment in time that Judas was handed over to Satan. F.F. F. Bruce describes this scene brilliantly. He says, quote, Jesus' action in singling Judas out for a mark of special favor may have been intended as a final appeal to him to abandon his treacherous plan and play the part of a true disciple. Up to that moment, the die had not been irrevocably cast. If Judas wavered for a second, it was only to steal himself to carry out his fatal resolution, to become the willing instrument of Satan whereas he might have been the free follower and messenger of his master. Satan, here's something very key, great theology in this little sentence here. Satan could not have entered into him had he not granted him admission. That's incredibly important because God does not do evil. <coughs> Judas granted him permission. Had he been willing to say no to the adversary, all of his master's intercessory power was available to him there and then to strengthen him. But when a disciple turns traitor, when the spiritual aid of Christ is refused, that person's condition is desperate indeed. Again, we see in verse 27, Jesus is in control. Jesus tells Judas when he can go. Go now. Interestingly, this is terribly important, even as we took up the Lord's Supper here now. This here is about to begin the institution of the Lord's Supper. 
This is the first time it's about to be had. Here's where Jesus explains it. Satan cannot have a part in it. Judas could not have been there while this was taking place. He had to leave the room. He had to be gone. God will not allow company with Satan. Jesus also had a tradition that Judas knew about. After supper, after this supper in particular, you go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. You sing. You pray. You worship. And Judas knew that would be the place to be to get Jesus. I find it interesting as John throughout his whole gospel often uses light and darkness to describe things in a spiritual manner. And here, John says, and it was night. Folks, don't just think it's all about time. When John writes things like this in this context, everybody knew it was evening, it was nighttime. He didn't need to write this down except for the fact he's using the light and darkness parallel to show Judas had now stepped into darkness and it was a dark night in his soul. He was going to do a deed of darkness. That, that's a profound phrase. So, what can we learn from this passage? There's several things that I want to just draw attention to. First of all, it's very easy for people to be able to read the Bible. We talked about various translations in Sunday school today. We have access to it. You can even pick up a Bible at Wally World. Walmart, sorry. Uh, you, you can get Bibles everywhere. Anybody can go to church. You can go to any church. People can get baptized. They can listen to Christian radio. But if a person does not turn their life over to Jesus Christ and allow Him to be Lord and Savior, that person will go to hell. I don't care how many times you come to church. I don't care how many times you've read through the Bible. I don't care how many seconds you were under in a baptism. I believe that in our nation, we have been blessed with so much. Our nation is not much different than Judas. <coughs> Being given such privilege, such opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth with such power. But I am convinced that a large multitude will be spending eternity in hell because of the opportunity that has been given if they've chosen worldly pleasure instead. They've chosen humanism instead. They've chosen anything which is in contradiction to God. Judas, you can't have more opportunity than he had getting through it all away. We also see here something that's scary. Judas had a great love for money. You don't see it right in this passage, but as you do a cross-study of Judas and everything about Judas, you see that he had a fascination with money. Remember when the perfumed oil was being poured out on Jesus' feet? And Judas, what a waste. That could have been used to take care of the poor. For shame, for shame. And yet the scripture says he didn't really care about the poor. See, it's kind of hard to embezzle money if you don't have your hands on it. And he was known as an embezzler. His focuses seem to be on the world, finances, position, not being God-honoring. Remember what Paul said? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We also read the scriptures that you cannot serve God and money same time. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. You, you can't marry them. Now, I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing money. Please understand that. But it's the love of money. Be extremely careful. Money is a tool. Money belongs to God. Use it wisely, but don't obsess over it. It can happen in homes. It can happen in relationships. It can happen in church. I've heard more than my share of those who have what I call the financial Judas syndrome. 
They have an ability to sound logical, pious, responsible, but often it's a covering for power and control. Be careful. I also see how easy it is in a group like this to think everything's okay. The other 11 disciples, they didn't know what was going on. And Judas probably thought, hey, I'm with Jesus. I'm in the right crowd. But he was pretending to be something that he wasn't, right? That's hypocrisy. So what does that do with us? Folks, it's very easy to become hypocritical. I tell people that talk about not wanting to go to church because it's full of hypocrites, I'll say one more won't hurt. <laughs> Didn't go over very well, let me tell you. <laughs> the other side is, no, a hypocrite is one who's pretending to be something that they're not. We know we're sinners that have been saved by grace. We struggle. Now, if you're looking for perfection, don't come because I'm the pastor and you'll be there. Okay. But we want to live for Jesus. We want to live for Jesus. So what do we do? Maybe we ought to listen to some of David's prayers. Search me, O oh God. Try me. Test me. See if there be any wickedness within me. That's not a fun prayer, by the way, because he does. Oh, man, I didn't want to see that guy. The only issue you did, you asked me to show you. Or maybe we need to pray something very simple. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. When you pray those prayers, you can't really wear the mask of hypocrisy very well. Because God will reveal. I'm also amazed here at Christ's incredible patience and his steadfast love. Wow. I, I think I'd have zapped Judas by this time. I'd have zapped him the first time he spoke up, probably. Not Jesus. And then I'm reminded, isn't it wonderful that he didn't do that to me the first time? <laughs> Second, third, fourth, go on. To God be the glory for his mercy and his grace. Not only did Jesus show me that at one point in time, he still shows me. And I share that with us because you and I need to show that same mercy, that same love, that same compassion. That same tenderness, especially to those who are unsaved. How else will they know unless they see Christ in us? One of the things that surprises me is that this is going on right in the middle of this group of men who were extremely close and nobody saw it. And I take that as a bit of a caution that we need to understand that Satan is always working. See it? That's, that's not a sheep, folks. I, I know you guys know that. That's a wolf dressed up like one. And look, the lambs are right there not taking notice. Do you see that? I looked a long time to find a picture like that. How often that is very much like what happens in the church. There's a wolf that comes in and seeks to create disruption. See, if great things are happening for the glory of God, Satan doesn't like it, and he wants to mess it up. And folks, this doesn't scare me. Please understand, it shouldn't scare you either, because we serve Jesus Christ. But be aware, because Satan will do whatever he can to destroy the testimony of the church on this earth. Just be aware. He looks very much like you and I. Another thing we can learn is that Satan is a liar and a deceiver. Those who are not followers of Jesus Christ are able to be used by Satan. Hypocrisy often looks very spiritual. You catch that? Hypocrisy often looks very spiritual. But it's cloaked to look like something which is not. And that requires self-evaluation and sometimes a gentle reminder to others to be careful. And sometimes it may mean, as we saw Paul and John and Peter doing on different occasions, calling someone out and saying, what you are doing 
is of Satan. That's not being judgmental, but using God's word. But using God's word. Finally, we can gather that even though Satan and Judas thought they had it all figured out, Jesus was still in control. R.C. Sproul, some of you have read some of his works. I love this quote. If God is not sovereign, God is not God. I am encouraged by this as I look through Scripture to know that there's nothing in heaven or on earth that will destroy God's plans. And you and I need to be reminded of that, especially in light of the times in which we find ourselves living. God is still in control, and even when it looks as if the end is near, God is glorified. You see, everyone has choices. With all choices come consequences. So you and I need to present Jesus in such a way that others would choose him. So my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. If we recognize God being sovereign, that he's in control, then we need to recognize, we need to give up some things and recognize he alone is my strength and my shield. Let's stand as we sing together in closing as the deer.
Jesus and him alone. Now, we know in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that they met together and they broke bread. I don't know if there's any bread to be broken, but there's some to be eaten probably downstairs. So I want to invite all of you to come downstairs. Even if you didn't bring something, you want to join, you can find something to nibble on or nibble off your neighbor's plate. But I want to invite you all to come down and enjoy the fellowship and the food together, okay? God's blessings on each one of you.